Friends, let me encourage you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the New Testament letter of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to be in chapter 1 in just a moment, Philippians chapter 1. And on your way there, I've got to tell you, though, not long ago, there was an old movie on. It's old now, 1991. That's an old movie now. Do you remember City Slickers? Yeah? Billy Crystal, Jack Palance. Billy Crystal plays the part of this this city-dwelling, high-strung executive who's so stressed out, life falling apart, goes out west to a dude ranch. To work it all out, he meets Curly, an old crusty cowboy who spends time with him, showing him the ropes. And they're riding along one day, and and he said, Curly, your life just seems to make sense. It, It seems so clear. What is the purpose of life? What's the point of it all? And Curly just laughed. (laughs) He said, what's so funny, Curly? Why are you laughing? He said, all you city folks are the same. You spend 50 weeks a year getting your rope all tied in knots and expect to come out here for two weeks and get it untied. He said, you want to know what the secret of life is? He said, yes, I do. I want to know. And Curly did this. To which Billy Crystal's character said, what, your finger? No. One thing. One thing. You find the one thing that is more important than every other thing and go find that. And when you find that one thing, all the other things don't mean squat. (laughs) You picking up what I'm putting down? What is your one thing? Because I meet people all of the time who live good lives and they try so hard and they chase after whatever their one thing is and they never find it. And having never found the one thing that is supreme above every other thing, they they live lives of of just disappointment, like a low-grade fever of discontentment and disillusionment because they can't find the one thing or worse than that. There's something worse than that. Seeking the thing that you think is the one thing and then putting everything that you have into that pursuit and at the end of that pursuit, realizing it didn't give you the thing that you thought it was going to give you. Oh, It's like Thomas Merton said. Thomas Merton said, it's possible some people, well, they, they spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success and they make it all the way to the top of the ladder of success only to realize at the end of life the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. What's your one thing? It's important to be thinking about what your one thing is because today we're in the middle of this series I'm calling 6910. That's our street address if you're new to us. Of course, if you're new to us, you know that because you put it in your GPS. 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road. And we're talking about what does it mean for the body of Christ to rise. We're talking these many weeks about what does it look like for the post-pandemic body of Christ in these ages to truly rise up here at this address, 6910. And these many weeks I've been attempting in different ways and through different expressions to proclaim the reality that our one thing as a church can be nothing more than, nothing less than, and nothing other than the risen Christ of God. That's our one thing. And that everything that we do here as a church and everything that we become and are shaped into becoming here at this church is so that our lives would be lived in alignment with the Christ of God, Jesus. And in living a life of alignment with God in Christ, then we, we get to know him better and And in knowing him better, we become more like him. And in becoming more like him, we end up just doing the things that he did. And then the world around us pays attention. 
And they see in our lives the evidence that he really is resurrected because they see it in our lives that we love more fully and we forgive more easily and we share more generously our lives away. But it occurred to me this week as I was thinking about that truth that is 6910, we've got to have one thing. It's one thing. It is Christ and only Christ. But it occurs to me, we are a body of believers, but a body is made up of many members. And until the members of the body make the individual choices to make Christ the one thing for his life or her life or a family's life, then our attempt to be in union with each other, in solidarity of purpose, in singularity of purpose, will always be threatened until every man, woman, boy, and girl makes an individual choice to wake up each day and say, this day, the one thing for me is him. Today, if you're paying attention to taking notes or paying attention to the conversations we've been having, I want to call this message today, For to me, to live is Christ. That's the title. And that's the one thing. For to me, to live is Christ. And if you've been around church at all, you know that that line is is lifted right out of a verse from the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians. The, The full verse sounds like this, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. But to understand the power of that verse in each of our individual lives, in order to understand the power of what it means to have Christ be the one thing, that for to me to live is Christ, we have to understand the context in which that verse emerges in the life of Paul. So Paul is in prison and he's in Rome. He's waiting for the execution of his one life. He's on trial for his life and Nero, that corrupt emperor, Nero will give him the thumbs up or the thumbs down to let him know whether he lives or dies and waiting for his execution, which ultimately happened. He tells everybody he can about the one thing that matters more than anything. He preaches about it and talks about it. He writes about it and sings hymns about it. He won't shut up about it. In fact, he won't shut up so vigorously and passionately that he's writing every letter he can to every church he's ever known and they pick up on the news that his life is in danger. They know that he's on trial for his life and it doesn't look good. And while he's writing to them about his circumstances and the outlook doesn't look good, he has no control over the future, no control over the outcome, he wants them to know it's okay. Somebody here has come into worship today needing to hear a word not from one man, not from a choir, not from another mortal, but from the Lord who needs you to know it will be okay. I wonder if we might read together from Philippians chapter 1 beginning in verse 12. Listen to how Paul describes his dire circumstances Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains... Most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I wonder if I might talk for just a moment about what it means to be in chains for Christ. Everybody's got a chain. Everybody, live long enough and everybody will have a chain. And your chain may look different than the chain of 
the person sitting to your right or left or the person you think most of in this life. But everybody has a chain. A chain may come in the form of a diagnosis. A chain may come through a treatment that racks your body with pain. A chain may come relationally. Maybe it's not physical at all. Maybe your chain has nothing to do with the fact that you can't do what your body used to do. Maybe relationally you can't have what you used to have. Maybe your chain is a kind of loss that weighs down on you heavily and you feel as if your life is constricted, bound up by a chain you can't control because everything that you thought was familiar and everything that was good and comfortable in life has been taken away from you. Everybody knows what it's like to have a chain around your heart. Some chains are visible and some chains you can't see. Somebody has a chain of anxiety in this room. Yes. And you wish you had a voice to cry out. (laughs) Yeah. Am I right? But but you can't because some chains are invisible and you, you would, if you could, just cry out like you did when you were young and nobody cared. But now if you cry out and tell somebody about your chain, oh, they'll think all kinds of things about you. Everybody knows what it's like to wear a chain. And, and Paul says, but I want you to know that I'm in chains for Christ. And he doesn't just mean that his crime was Christ. And it was. He proclaimed the audacious truth that there is an authority in this life above all earthly authorities. You don't preach that sermon long before Caesar hears about it. His crime was Christ. In fact, if I wanted to, and if I had a little time today, what I might do is talk about if Christ were a crime. If Christ were a crime and you were on trial because you are being accused of living the way of Christ in this world, my question is, would there be any evidence to convict you? Have you loved deeply enough? Have you forgiven somebody who's wronged you? Have you shared what God has put in your hands with a hurting world? Is there any evidence to convict you of the crime of living like Jesus? I'm in chains for Christ, he said. But he doesn't just mean that he's in chains because of the crime of preaching a gospel besides Caesar is Lord. He's saying, I am in chains. But these chains are for a purpose. I didn't ask for them, and I didn't want them. And they they constrict me in ways where I can't move around like I wanted to move around. But I want you to know that I'm in chains for Christ because these chains that I didn't ask for and I didn't want, these chains that I wish would just fall away, have given me a platform to proclaim the love of God like I never would have proclaimed If I were not in chains, it's possible that the chain that you wear, the chain that I wear in my life, as much as we don't want to wear it, carry it around, drag it behind us like a ball that weighs us down, it may be that your chain is your pulpit. Because how many people are looking at you knowing what you are bearing, knowing what you're carrying around, and and yet they're looking at you and seeing the possibility of a love so deep that it makes its way past the chain to your heart. What if your chain is for Christ? Did you notice what he said in the text? He said, this chain that I'm, I'm in chains for Christ, and now I've proclaimed, and the whole palace guard and everyone else has heard it. Did you hear that verse? I think it's like verse 13 or so. Yeah. As a result, it has become clear through the whole whole palace guard. I wonder, I wonder what that means that the whole palace guard knew. Because that's like the the top tier security. It makes me wonder when he was talking and wouldn't shut up about it, about all he'd been through. When he's talking to the palace guard, I wonder if he tells the story about that Roman centurion because they would relate to that. See, That Roman centurion who at the foot of the cross looked up at the crucified Jesus and said, surely this man was the son of God. I wonder what it means that the whole palace guard now knew. And if he was that at the center of the power systems of the world right there in Rome, I wonder if some of the senators might have stopped by the jail cell 
to pay him a visit and ask him a little bit more. And I wonder if, given the opportunity, Paul took the opportunity to talk to them about politics. I mean, he's a preacher talking about politics, but he's on, he's on trial. What's he got to lose? And I wonder if he told him that day about the day they tried to trap Jesus politically. Is it lawful, Lord, to, to rent, to pay, pay taxes to Caesar? And they hold a, a coin out before him, and, and he says, Give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and give to God the things that bear the image of God. I wonder what it means that in this text, Paul said, The whole palace guard and everyone else. Did you notice that phrase? Everyone else now has heard. And I wonder what that means. I wonder if the wives at market are talking with their kids running around as they are at the market that morning. I wonder if they have overheard the words that Paul spoke about a man who welcomed the unwelcomable. About the one who was so welcoming and inclusive that even women and children were welcome in his circle. I don't know what it really means that Paul said these chains are for Christ. But maybe the bigger question is, what does it mean that your chains are for Christ? What does it mean? That you bear this chain and you drag it around and you've asked God again and again and again, take it away. Take it away. I can't stand this chain on my life. But what if the chain is not caused by God? has to somehow punish you, but this chain that is in your life is used by God to bring glory and witness to a God who meets you in the midst of your incarceration. Well, he goes on to say in verse number 15, pick this up right here. It is true that some preach out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of a selfish ambition, not, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? I love that. What does it matter, he says. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. A little unpacking of that context is important here. Apparently, while he is on house arrest, some people were bringing up some things that were attempting to discredit Paul. Some have said that they were the the Judaizers. That's the word that's used for a group of people who were preaching about Jesus, yes. But they were preaching that before you found freedom in Jesus, you had to somehow become a part of the religion of Judaism first. You had to become a Jew first and then have access to the love of God and Christ It was a distortion of the freedom that Paul had found in Christ. And he knew that it was bringing a discrediting reputation to his preaching. And so people let him know, hey, there's people out here talking about you, and and they're actually doing more damage to you because they're preaching Christ, but in a way that is opposite of the way you're talking about it, and your reputation is being smeared. And he says, what does it matter? If they're preaching Christ, I don't matter. You know what happens when Christ becomes your one thing? When Christ becomes your one thing, your ego no longer is. Now, I said something there, and I don't know if you picked up what I just, I delivered to you, a truth that can change somebody's heart. When Christ becomes the one thing, your ego no longer does. Paul recognizes that if his reputation is discredited, he may lose all authority, lose all sense of access to those he's trying to access. But he says, if they're preaching Christ, what do I matter? I wonder if there's somebody here who knows what it's like to have done everything right. You checked all the boxes. You ordered your life right. You lived righteously You lived with discipline, and yet no matter what you did, somebody was out to get you. Anybody know what that's like? And no matter what you did, they they either talked bad about you or smeared your name or, or worse, worse, ignored you completely. Do you know the pain of being overlooked at work, overlooked in a family, overlooked in a a, a sphere of, of a community? And Paul says, look, the thing is, if Christ is your one thing, then you decrease so that he can increase. 
When Christ becomes your one thing, when you're able to say, for to me to live is Christ, then your prayer becomes, Lord, less of me, more of you. Diminish me so that in me all they see is you. He continues in verse number 18, and because of this I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that your prayer, or through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And here it is. For to me, to live is Christ. Paul says, I know where I am. I know it all hangs on the balance. I know there's much to lose, and I have no control over it. Do you know what it's like to be in a season where you literally have no control of the outcome of your life in that season? Paul says, look at me, because whether I live or whether I die, if I live, I live to Christ. And if I die, I go to Christ. Either way, I am with Christ. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it raises maybe the most important question I want to raise for all of us this morning. If you were to fill in the blank in that verse, for to me, to live is blank. What would it be? And and be careful before you get too spiritual and quickly answer the Sunday school answer or the thing that you think I'm fishing for. I want you to understand that you and I, we are already filling in the blank by the way we live. The people who watch you, the people who see you, the people who hear you can tell you what your blank is. For to them, to live is this, because that's all they ever talk about. No, no, for them, to live is this other thing, because that's all they ever care about. That's all they ever pursue. That's where they spend their time. That's where they spend their money. That's where they spend their passions. So it's not a mystery to the rest of us how they would fill in their blanks, but it's because it's clear to us the question is how would you fill in your blank? For to me, to live is winning. For to me, to live is image. For to me, to live is body image, beauty, perfection. For me, to live is material gain, wealth, success, winning (laughs) for to me to live is worry because that's all I ever think about for to me uh, to to live is panic trouble fear because that's what's gripped my life for to me to live is is a fear of failure for to me to live is a fear of losing them or it or myself beloved I may even say to our graduates, to you guys, how do you, don't answer, it's okay. How do you fill in the blank? Because I promise you, you will be offered a lot of really worthy options. Because some of us will fill it in with what seems to be noble options. For me to live as my family. Yes, sure. But family is not eternal either. How will you fill your blank? Because we hope that you will go off and do the thing that you go and do, right? We pray that you would fix some of the things that we have broken. (laughs) We pray that you would go and do what we've always done. Go and discover fire again. Show us what it is that we are lacking. Go and pursue it, but don't pursue it at the risk of filling that blank with anything more than, less than, or other than Christ. Do you know in the same book, In the book of Philippians, two chapters later, there's this moment where Paul says, listen, y'all aren't hearing me. That's what he says. Not really, but that's how I kind of hear him saying, y'all aren't hearing me. He's like, I've chased everything. 
I've chased everything that would give affirmation and applause and accolade in my life. In fact, here's how he says it. He said, if someone thinks they have reasons to to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Uh, Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. In other words, I have every reason to fill that blank with some really worthy things. Here's my resume. But whatever gains to me, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. Do you know what that word really is in Greek? It's a word that sometimes is translated um, dung. If cowboy curly were translating, he'd say, all the other stuff don't mean dung that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Beloved, if I can just appeal to you one last time, what is it that is your one thing that is supreme above everything? Because if it is anything less than Christ, Anything other than Christ, I promise disappointment. I promise disillusionment. But in this moment, right now, you can change the blank of your life. In this moment, right now, you could surrender every false pursuit that has led you into disappointment. And you can change it out for the only worthy one. And you do that through prayer. In fact, sitting right where you are, it may be that today you're in a place where you recognize I'm more vulnerable than I've ever been before. You're in a place where you recognize I am now more frustrated than I've ever been before because everything that I've attempted has ended in disappointment. But today I yield myself to the power of God's love in the person of Jesus Christ. I yield to you, God. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins and heal me in the places where I have been broken and restore me in those places where I have broken my own life. And I will follow you and you will be enough and I will be okay. I pray that in the name of Jesus the Lord of life. Amen. Friends, you may be here today and you just prayed that prayer. It may be that you you prayed something like it. You leaned into my own words as you were attempting to pray it in your heart. And I need you to know that is the first and most important step you can make. But there is a second step. The second step is to tell somebody about it. So that someone who loves you can walk alongside you and show you our own scar tissue, our own battle wounds where we have failed and learned from it. That's why I'm asking my pastors right now to come and join me at the front and along the front of the sanctuary, they will remain here today so that at the conclusion of this benediction that I issue, they are here to listen to you, to pray with you. It may be that today you you come forward at the end of this benediction because it's time for you to declare, He is my Lord. To me, He is everything. He is everything. And maybe today is the day that you come forward and say, it's time for me to step into the waters of baptism and proclaim to the world that I am His. It may be that today 
you come forward to say, I need to be a part of this church family. Because if this church is made up of broken people like that pastor and imperfect people like that pastor who keeps falling on his face again and again and tells us about it every week, then maybe I need to be a part of a family like that. You come forward and join the fellowship, the membership of this congregation. But whatever the decision, don't wait another week. Don't wait another moment. Act on But now, it's time for us to come to the most important moment of our gathering. This moment when this gathering becomes a scattering, where the living, breathing, risen body of Christ scatters into these neighborhoods and into these communities around here, and we live out loud a life that demonstrates we actually believe these things that we've affirmed in this place. So as you are ready and as you are able, stand for the benediction. Beloved, y'all are driving me crazy. I love you more every week. Just the moment I feel like I can run out of love, I just I love you more because of the way you keep on trying. And you keep on showing up and you keep on getting up. And my prayer for you is that wherever you go this week, that Christ would go before you to prepare your way. That Christ would go behind you in the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left abiding closer than anybody, closer than a sister or brother. May Christ go above you on the days when dark clouds roll in to remind you there really is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. May may Christ go beneath you, girding you, removing all forms of fear, but mostly may Christ go in you transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm.